and we're back! And this time it's someone that I've honestly been rather nervous to have a chat with because it's someone who was once my composition teacher at the Sydney Conservatorium. This week I'd like to welcome on board prolific composer and officer of the Order of Australia, Carl Vine. For those who are not already acquainted with his background, portfolio, and to put it lightly, his resume, Carl has been one of Australia's most prolific composers, listed by Limelight in 2015 as one of Australia's top 10 greatest composers, who aside from crafting his music has been the long-standing, 19-year-long, in fact, artistic director of Australian chamber music organisation Musica Viva. He currently continues to compose and also teaches at the Sydney Conservatory of Music. So thank you for coming on board for the podcast. Hi Vicky. I really had no idea where to start in terms of what to ask you, but I suppose a possible way in would be your evolution as a composer. Before I met you, I was looking at all of your music and it was perhaps a little bit more electronic with more collaborations with dance and other mediums like film um, and theatre. And by the time I came to study with you, it was a lot of concert hall music. How would you describe your evolution as a composer? Well, it, it's interesting because I started off as a modernist. That was my um, ethos and my aesthetic, that, that every work had to be a completely uh, uh, novel event that had never been heard before. And this was a kind of view of the audience as these rather stupid sheep who needed to be educated. And uh, I, to me, that, that it's an extreme... Uh, view of the modernist argument, but that's what I grew up with as a teenager, and I'd actually um, bought into the the Stockhausen line that the the new music for the new world uh, had to be electronic, and I was very good at electronics, and I built. Uh, synthesizers and so on. At the same time I was a concert pianist or training to be a concert pianist and so I'd, I had this dual identity and I'd, I would compose electronic music and then play Bach and Beethoven and then Bartok and more modern people. So basically I, I've never had a game plan. I've never had... Uh, all I wanted to be was a composer pianist, whatever that meant, and that has changed over the years. And so after the first 10 years of being a professional composer, I, I, it dawned on me that the modernist argument really wasn't uh, cutting it for me. It, I, it did not represent me in any meaningful way and that I had to find a way to actually look back at the things I adored, which was um, uh, impressive harmonic progressions and singable lyrical melodies and actually incorporate these into uh, a view of the music that I needed to do and that that then has changed continually for the last uh, what is it now uh, 35 years would you say that you've kind of considered the audience more as a result yeah absolutely and and the the problem with modernism as a as an ethos is that it is isolating and arrogant and it's built on the idea that you have this uh, majestic, magical vision of things that common people cannot understand. And therefore, what's the point? You know, uh, if you are not working with people, if you are not contributing something to those around you, you are wasting your time. Uh, we don't have very long on this earth and let's make the most of each other and contribute to, uh, particularly in this time where the world is going a little bit crazy yet again, um, we need to contribute to a sense of unity and um, contribution to a common good. Do you think that's the role of being an artist or a composer? I think it's everybody's role. I think uh, no matter what you're doing, you know, if, if you are uh, a lawyer or working at a convenience store or whatever it is you're doing, you are part of something much larger than yourself and we all have to contribute. What I love about the pandemic that we're in the middle of right now is that the most important people are the people working at supermarkets and cleaners and security staff. And those are the, the kinds of jobs that we tend to denigrate or regard as less valuable. I've always uh, had the highest respect for garbage collectors 
because without them, we'd all be completely, literally lost in garbage. And, and you know, they're, they're not, it's not a highly respected profession, but it's absolutely critical. And you mentioned the word lawyer before, and I was watching some of your older interviews and you spoke about if you had your time over again, you might have considered a law degree. Why law exactly? I, well, it seems to me that um, studying for law is possibly the most acute way to uh, hone your mental skills. And uh, certainly the lawyers I know, that I tend to know a lot of rather good lawyers uh, because of my uh, work as a, uh, in concert presenting. Um, and they tend to have the sharpest minds and the most, in, to me, the most interesting um, intellect. And it's not, I suspect, because they were smart to begin with. They've actually, they've just learnt to, um, how to work well with their brain. And that would be conducive to working compositionally, you think? Well, you know, I, I, um, I've always, well, since the age of five, I've always done something musical. But in terms of what I was saying before about contributing to society, I could actually, I, I was a web designer for uh, five years, quite happily, and, and pretty much gave up composing for a little while. Um, and I was actually quite happy doing that. And so I, I got back into music um, because I, I finally felt a lack after about four or five years. And uh, so I thought, no, no, I, I can go back now. But uh, I, I would actually be quite happy with a number of jobs um, that are non-musical, indeed non-artistic. If you talk about a lack, do you still mean that it felt like you had a lack of creative output? Um, no, I, I just thought I've, um, I've got more to say. So it wasn't, it wasn't that I was, you know, bursting with the need to put something out there. I just thought I, I actually have some ideas and I'd, I'd like to do that now because, uh, you know, I'd already been, had quite a career, um, up until that point. Um, I had the option of, of coming back into it. It, it is very difficult. I was 43 when I um, gave Composing a Miss, and I really only came back to it properly uh, when I was, uh, let me think, 48. Oh, okay. In terms of re-entering the scene, was there an awareness or perception that your position of where you sit as a composer in terms of hierarchy, was that a prominent feature in how you were experiencing the re-entry? For example, writing for orchestra, there is a perception maybe predominantly by the public that the composer is at the top of the hierarchy, but in reality we're probably somewhere in the middle or given some of the people I've spoken to in previous episodes, they talk about being at the bottom of the hierarchy. Hence, they're feeling like there's a lot of difficulty working with larger ensembles like orchestras. Um, look, I, that has changed in the last few years anyway. I was probably at the peak of my career in my 40s. Um, and at that time, orchestras, uh, dance companies, theatre companies, everybody commissioned new music. And so um, there's a lot less of that now. And indeed, orchestras in Australia now comparatively rarely commission new music compared to what was happening in the 90s. There was a lot, I think there was a lot more music happening. Um, and concert presenters of all sorts, I think are now, um, it's much harder for them to make a case for new music, uh, which is ridiculous. And that's a, a question I hope we'll come back to. But um, th that has changed generally. As to the level of the hierarchy, I don't know. As, as I say, my impression is that if orchestras are higher up in the hierarchy, most of them don't really know what to do with new music. Ah, why do you think that is? The way they're run or how their financial model is? Well, it, it's a financial model, but the, it's the kind of the, the triumph of the um, publicity departments. <laughs> but, um, you know, better orchestras are, are a, a step apart, but... Um, uh, a lot of orchestras are actually guided by marketing principles rather than aesthetic ones, and, and that is a problem. And I think you can tell the, the great orchestras was they, they give far more emphasis to the, the artistic design of the season of the orchestra's repertoire. Um, and the ones who are struggling a bit 
finish up with very little option but to actually do what the marketing people say. But that only makes sense if you want to hold on to a certain kind of listenership. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think they're wrong, in fact, and that, and that any concert presenter needs to have uh, to take an audience on a, on a journey with them. And most of the orchestras around the world are regional. So, you know, you can talk about the Chicago Symphony or the, the London Symphony. They are regional orchestras and they have to service their town um, and the region around that town. And it's just as true of a small regional orchestra in Australia. Um, and they need to take that audience, that community with them. And you do that by engaging, not by simply playing to people's uh, uninformed expectations. Why do you think this culture has evolved? I really only know Australia well in terms of uh, closely in relation to orchestral programming, that we play the same classical hits of the same repertoire, like Bach and Beethoven, and there's so much Mozart programmed every year, I think more than any other composer in Australia. So why do you think there seems to be a lack of engagement with local and living practitioners? Well, it's because they are being led in most most cases by the marketing department. And it's a fear of uh, alienating the audience. But what it fails to do is engage the audience. And if you simply send out a questionnaire saying, what music do you like? Then you will get, oh, I love Beethoven, I love Mozart. That's the wrong question, right? What you have to do is um, give a series of options of stuff that people do not know, that they have not encountered before whether they're living or dead composers but you then have to say here's something exciting try this out but you have to take the audience with you if you simply have an entire year's program that's all adventurous difficult music then they won't come with you and that's what the marketers fear that the moment you bring in new music you lose the audience it's the wrong way around you need to take the audience with you do you think there's partly because of perception of new music as being in some way so abstract and so experimental that it's terrifying for a guaranteed audience, say 3,000 seats in the Sydney Opera House. Well, there is certainly an element of that. And there are types of, of uh, contemporary music going back. Uh, you know, we are paying uh, the price now of the avant-garde of the 1970s and 1980s, which was the modernist ethos. And it was aggressive. It was dismissive and arrogant. And, and frankly hard to listen to and we're still paying the price for that so you need to uh, move cleverly and carefully and that that's what I tried to do when I was with Music of Eva um, as designing um, concert programs that uh, engaged people. And with Music of Eva did you find that because there are two branches the really enormous education branch that Music of Eva Viva runs as well as the touring and the concerts. Do you think the balance between the two of those in terms of exposing people of different ages to different repertoire helped? Well, uh, th they are uh, completely different um, enterprises within Music of Viva. And for those who don't know, Music of Viva is in fact the world's largest entrepreneur of chamber music. Uh, and it presents something like um, 3,000 concerts a year that uh, the education program um, presents to about 280,000 students every year. Um, and it's a mix of uh, genres within the idea of small live music performances. And then the concert program is about 100 concerts a year in major city, capital city venues. Uh, and so I was in charge of the uh, capital city stuff, the um, just the concert program. Um, and that had a, a, a national audience of around 20,000 so um, throughout Australia and the audience that goes to those concerts are mature um, adults frequently in their 60s and above. The clients for the education program are actually not the, not the students, it's the teachers who are the clients because the students don't book an ensemble to go and visit the school the the teacher does and so it's a, actually a, a massively different model in terms of what it has to do um, so the concert program is talking directly to its clients 
the education program is talking to the teachers, it's talking to the supervisors of the client and has to fulfil educational purposes. The concert program doesn't have to be educational. It does have to uh, incorporate this sense of shared community and shared discovery. And so the, the program I, I worked on would commission at least uh, four or five works every year to be part of the 100 concert annual season. And those works would all get, you know, eight to ten performances and two or three national broadcasts. That's what I find amazing, that you have repeat performances, because there's always a tendency where, I mean, it, sometimes larger pieces don't get played more than once beyond their premiere. But but that, that was the great thing about uh, Music of Eva, that it did have this capacity with a national audience. One group will come, and it's frequently a, a very high-quality international uh, performing ensemble, and they will do a f- full tour of Australia. And this doesn't happen anywhere in the world. Um, and if that if that group has done a tour of America, they work with six different presenters or ten different presenters. So they come to Australia. It's Music of Eva does all ten concerts, and so they carry the same program with the commissioned work, balanced very carefully and thoughtfully with the rest of their repertoire, whatever that might be. Do you think that's kind of a way of spreading Australian work around the world, getting these international performers like Absolutely. playing the commissioned work? Well, it, it's happened. It, it works. Um, and particularly, uh, you know, we, we would always consult with the international group and say, here's a number of composers. Do you like one? Can we commission one of these? And uh, they would choose it and then have a sense of ownership of that work and come and play it in Australia. And many of them keep it in their repertoire when they can afterwards. Amazing. I didn't realise I had a say. For some reason, I thought Music of Viva drove the commissioning arm. Uh, uh, yes, well, of course we did, <laughs> and and it was always composers that that I a set of composers I would choose. But we had to engage the artists. There's no point forcing an artist to play a work they didn't want to do. Mm. Um, but the negotiating uh, negotiation could take three years working out. And some of them would come and say, "Oh, I I know this Australian composer. I I want to play something by them," and that was terrific as well. But um, once again, the, the choice of composer and the genre and the style of music, that fitted within the general idea of a chamber music concert. And that rules out a lot of composers, particularly the more experimental ones. And that's just a question of that's what Music of Eva does. That makes sense. And coming from that commissioning arm, I had another question about the other programs that Music of Eva ran, particularly started by you when you were still there as the director. I think it was 2017. I think you started the women's program then, the Hildegard Project. Project. Uh, it was a little before then, but um, I'm trying to think. I had commissioned women before then, but this this was a particular focus on, on composing women. Um, and this was simply, um, uh, well, we've talked about this before, but it's about um, a redress of the imbalance. And um, of course there is a massive imbalance, particularly in classical music, and that the female composers before the 20th century are rare, incredibly rare. You know, it's three or four of them uh, that you can um, actually had any coverage at all. Um, but it's a mistake to say this is the fault of classical music. It's not. It's the fault of the world. <laughs> it's the fault of society. And, you know, in everything that women do, they are devalued, and that still continues. And so um, it is therefore um, an absolutely required redress of the balance. Um, I still wanted to make sure that all of the... And that this was special funding through Music of Eva for just for women, the women composers that we commissioned. Um, and it was just to say... Uh, like any affirmative action, it um, has the danger of then being unrepresentative, um, but it's still worth that chance. I don't think in um, in the result of, of what we commissioned with Music of Eva, I don't think there was any sacrifice of quality. I think there's some fantastic uh, work, and it really... Ultimately, it didn't matter if it was a man or a woman composing the music because you can't. 
tell. You can't listen to the music and say, oh, that's a woman. That doesn't work. Uh, but it was great music. And um, so it was really continuing the um, commissioning program that I'd been running for, well, I ran it for 19 years in different ways. Um, but making sure that we got um, uh, at least an equal number of women uh, involved. Which you did in 2018 and 2019. Yeah, that was uh, well, and, and in 2020. In fact, we, I think we had more women than men in 2020. But of course, none of those concerts went to air. So will they be delayed for, for next year's season? I don't know, because I'm no longer with the company. Oh, oh yes, that's right. The artistic director. So I have no idea if they're going to hang over or not. Okay, well, I hope so. Well, I hope so, yes. yeah. Well, having read a lot about women's programs rather recently, including criticisms of women's programs, one of the questions that comes up a lot is whether or not these programs or statements made by artistic companies or really any company in the world right now, because there's been a huge shift in the culture and conversation in the last five years, whether this discourages people, like men, from applying to certain things or excluding them from these spaces. Well, I, th I think there is a problem now um, that it is probably a really bad time to be a young male composer <laughs> in that every opportunity that arises now, and this is fantastic, uh, you know, now every opportunity says, uh, you know, for young or for, for women composers uh, or for young women. Um, and that's absolutely wonderful, but it's a lousy time to be a man. Um, and but this is part of the affirmative action, you know, men have had it for uh, um, the, the lion's share of the advantage for so long. It's time that they lost out for a bit. But I'm, I'm really happy that I'm not starting out right now. So I think it would be very hard. Um, and so but my view is, uh, look, it is artificial, but it's overdue. And um, the, what I would not do is damn any organization that is using this affirmative action to encourage women composers. I would not damn them for any reason. I think it's an absolutely reasonable and intelligent thing to do. It's just not so good for young men composers. I mean, sometimes it could be misconstrued in some ways to be discouraging, but we need this artificial step particularly at the beginning, in order to normalise seeing different people in different spaces. Absolutely. And look, I think in Australia, the equalisation is happening quite fast. Um, and because there has been um, a fairly universal acceptance of, of um, affirmative action in music, um, I think that we're, we're seeing much more even numbers very quickly. I think like in the last decade the proportion has changed. And it used to be at, uh, in the Australian Music Centre representing, I don't know, about four or 5,000 composers, that there was 25% uh, women represented. And I, th I think even that has grown to at least 33%. Yeah, it, it, it's grown already. But uh, uh, of course, the thing we know is that women composers are better than the men, but we just have to let them find find their own level. But they now have the chance, uh, I think, of, of not being discriminated against. For our first musical intermission is sneakily one of my favourites, and it's an excerpt from Carl's Symphony No. 5 Percussion Symphony, here recorded and performed in 1995 by the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and Synergy Percussion. This excerpt is taken from the Tarantella section from the work's single movement.
section of your career teaching do you think that having taught at the sydney conservatorium it has helped you find and engage with younger and emerging composers and to work closely with them well that, that's why i started working at the con i, I did not really need a third job um, but i did need to find good young composers um, and it was interesting that the um I thought the most interesting composers that I was working with then um, turned out to be the women. And I, that was just luck of the draw, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, I went in looking for young composers and surprise, surprise, there they were. All collectively. <laughs> so I think the largest, by far the largest composition cohort in Australia. So the cohort is 110 students uh, in composition. Uh, most composition departments are, have a dozen students. That's true. Just going overseas, sometimes there are only four students. Yep. Absolutely miniature <laughs> class. <laughs> have you found that teaching has helped you as well as a composer and also kind of helped you think about commissioning when you were in your last couple of years at Music Aviva? Uh, well, it, it was very handy uh, as a commissioner, uh, and um, uh, I actually developed a, a kind of um, career path for young composers in that there was a whole range of concert activities that I was in charge of, and so they would start with a morning concert, do a morning concert, then we had a couple of chamber music festivals, and then they would be commissioned for a chamber music festival. And if both of those work out, then they get the big commission for a major national tour with international performers. And so that was a kind of graduation level. Uh, and so there, there was a couple of composers, there was just enough time to get a couple of composers through to that higher level. I remember running into Elizabeth Union right before she moved to study in America and she went through that Music of Evo pathway, which is really cool because now I see a lot of her music being played around the world. Yeah, well, she was she was the uh, first or second to make it through. And I think there was one after, but I really only started that after uh, working at the con, which was uh, six years ago. So um, I didn't quite have enough time to move that forward. Are you you're still teaching? Un, are you teaching undergraduates there? Yeah, I am. Oh, well, under under and over graduates. Yeah. Well, I actually have a little anecdote in that when I was eight years old, Music of Viva actually came to my school and they brought with them. I think it was a brass quintet or a weird mixed ensemble, but it wasn't a wind quintet. And there were two French horns in there. And from that day, I became totally obsessed with the French horn for years, having never seen one before Music of Viva came to the school. Um, oh, well, my, I don't think my parents wanted me to play brass, but there we go. Well, French horn's a wonderful instrument. But that, that, I, we hear those stories every now and then about Music of Viva, the school's program, because it is massive and it is wonderful. Um, and uh, the horrible thing is the absence of government support for music training. Uh, in, in schools, and you, you were lucky that you went to a school that was smart enough to make sure they had specialist music tuition, but most of them don't, and particularly disadvantaged areas and state schools um, have very little opportunity for, for music training. And it's not just about the music, it's about the use of the brain, it's in fact about the um, uh, uh, hand-eye coordination, uh, muscle memory, all sorts of things that music assists. Uh, and kids who study music are better at everything, especially sciences. It's more, particularly if they are practicing music, if they play an instrument, uh, the brain works in a different way when you are playing because you have the, the left-right brain talking to each other far more than um, uh, in any other human activity and the corpus callosum in professional musicians is thicker than in normal people because the two halves of the brain have to communicate um, so much 
it is measurably thicker. And a good thing to encourage, but music kind of when you're younger, the level of access that you need in certain places in order to master it or even just to have lessons for two years is very high. Just having lessons, being able to have an instrument with you, if you can't hire it, you have to buy one. They tend to be a couple hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars. But that, that's why, uh, and you know, there, there are a number of programs that have been set up and it really doesn't cost very much um, for a school to have those instruments and not often get them donated uh, from outside the school but they need a trained mus uh, music teacher not just the PE teacher who has nothing better to do on a Thursday. Exactly and continuing from the anecdote of Music Aviva coming to my school they also brought with them a piece of Australian music and there was a pianist with them and the piece of music was a Miriam Hyde work. Um, I was also really lucky in that time that the two piano teachers I had before I eventually came to the con were both themselves students of Miriam Hyde so her repertoire was always in my grasp at all times to the point where there were even some original scores kept by my second teacher Dorothy Elvidge. The thing is if that program or repertoire isn't introduced to a younger set of people inclusive of tertiary education that could be potentially why there is a gap in wanting to experience new music or working with composers, because we don't get introduced to contemporary repertoire in our learning and our playing. Of course, of course. Um, and I, well, there's, there's no easy solution to any of that. But I think if there was a lot more music teaching going on, then there would be a broader repertoire. Do you think at a tertiary level, there should be a little bit more engagement between, say, the composition department and the performance students? Well, in a good uh, in a good uh, um, institution, I think that should absolutely happen. I'm just trying to think. I don't think it especially happens at Juilliard, for instance. Um, and the pattern, certainly in Australia, the pattern is there's almost no um, even cooperation between performers and composers, which is ridiculous. Uh, but that's why you mentioned Elizabeth Yunan. That's why I encouraged uh, Liz to go to Curtis Institute, because it, it is part of the program that every performer plays a work by one of the composers. And every ensemble at the Institute plays a work by the composers, and they have a commissioning program, and it is all joined together. And that's the way things should be, but almost never are. And you encouraged me to seek out a teacher when I went to Paris. And when I ended up at the Conservatoire de Paris, that's how they run things as well. All your classes are public. And if you're a new composer and the, the performers are interested in checking out who's there, they show up to your composition lesson. So who was your main teacher? I ended up with Thierry Esquiche. Aha. <laughs> he was one of the two I recommended you chase down. Yes, and he wrote back immediately. And he was brilliant because he took me not only around the conservatorium, so I ended up having private tuition in there for the six months I was there, but he took me with him when he performed on all these churches because he's also an improviser. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in fact, we, we had an ensemble that was uh, used to be based in Paris and they wanted to do a tour with Thierry, um, a tour of Australia. And the problem is we don't have the organs to yeah. do it. Well, we, you know, we have uh, uh, seven national venues. Only three of them have usable organs. Oh, really? Isn't you mean big concert halls or? Yes, concert halls. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it would be difficult in a cathedral. Well, yeah, um, yeah. The sight lines are awful. The sound is bad, particularly for piano trio with an organ, and um, we don't. They don't seat enough people. We need to seat a thousand per concert. Do you think in these institutions like Curtis and what I was experiencing Paris and kind of Paris in general being quite open to new things that their programming of new music is totally different because there is more a sense of collaboration within the community that is classical music? Well, I, I don't know what the deal is at the Conservatoire. Um, I do know that uh, at Curtis there is just the assumption that there will be modern music and all of the performers understand that and it isn't an issue, which it shouldn't be. Um, and you know, but on their um, composition staff, one of their uh, resident teachers is Jennifer Higdon, who's one of the 
you know, leading lights of new music in America. And so you'd be stupid not to take the opportunity to, to interface as a, as a pianist or a violinist with Jennifer Hickton. Why do you think there's been a change since the time that you were starting out towards your peak in your 30s and 40s all the way to now in terms of commissioning new music everywhere from chamber music to orchestral music? Um, well, it depends on what change you think has happened. So I think less has been commissioned now. Um, and I think it's the um, it's something to do with the triumph of economic rationalism over actual rationalism. <laughs> and so I, I think economic rationalism is irrational. You simply you can't measure everything in terms of its economic return. Uh, we don't work like that. Um, and particularly looking at anything to do with art or personal appreciation or meditation or anything to do with our internal qualities, the economic impact is kind of irrelevant. Um, but I, so that's that's what I suspect. That's what I fear. That economic rationalism has kind of thwarted the way that um, people go about their business, especially when it comes to um, music, musical matters do you think there's a fear because it costs so much in one hit to commission say a symphony and then they think the return is oh we're just going to play it once at the premiere and then maybe it will discourage the audience from buying tickets in the first place so we'll pair it up with something they'll recognize so we'll play the new piece in the first half and then play i don't know stravinsky in the second half just to ensure an audience I, I can tell you that I, in the last five years I've had two commissions. One was paired with um, Bolero, which apparently is the all that they only, you know, they save that up for once a decade when they've got a completely unsellable program. They put Bolero in the other half. And so that was to sell my concerto for two pianos. And the other one was um, a Holst the Planets. And that again is a once in a decade work they save up for something unsaleable, which was my eighth symphony. Different orchestras, uh, that different reasoning and, you know, different. Um, but yes, that absolutely goes on. Do you find that annoying as a as a practice that bigger institutions do with the companion pieces? As a programmer of music, I understand exactly where they're coming from and they're wrong. And that you you have to uh, as I said before, you have to take the audience with you. You have to. Um, what I am very proud of at Music of Eva is over the, the 19 years I was there, the audience expected new music. And that was always what they were talking about in Interval was the new piece in the program, which is normally before Interval. But we didn't have, you don't have blockbuster works in chamber music. So. You know, Beethoven Opus 131 maybe in the second half. But um, there was an excitement about hearing new music. Now, only one of the orchestras I, I, uh, I've worked with has that sense, and it's the West Australian Symphony. They've actually um, uh, certainly tried to create that sense of expectation in the audience, and their, their commissioning program is still exemplary within Australia. Most of the others are simply afraid of the t uh, losing ticket sales. And so they either don't commission or they just keep trotting out, you know, Beethoven 5, Bolero, and <laughs> Holst, the planets, you know, time and time again, just because they have some obligation to still commission new music. And they're just trying to find a way to whitewash the new music. And it's the wrong approach. What you need to do is create a sense of expectation and thrill about something you've never heard before. And I would say because they do take the largest chunk of the public funding, they do have a responsibility to engage with living people, living composers and new performers. We, we don't really talk too much about new experimental performers working closely with big things like orchestras, but they do have a responsibility partly because of the financing they receive. Well, that, that is normally why they finish up playing any new music at all, because they have to. Not because there is any artistic vision or belief in the value of this to their audience or the world in general. It's because, oh, well, we've got to do one of these or they'll cut our funding. Once again, it's this inverse economic rationalism. Do you think they feel an obligation also to the level of philanthropy they require to run as an orchestra to play the things that 
perhaps there a certain audience wants to hear, say, the Beethoven and the Mozart? Uh, well, absolutely. But then the a lot of the commissioners are well-heeled people who have taste and interest, and they are the ones who, in fact, force them to play new music. Um, and with companies, I was going to say like Music of Eva, there are no companies like Music of Eva, um, it has a large number, a very diverse range of sponsors, and they are the ones who always want the new music. And so um, they are, in fact, frequently lawyers or occasionally businessmen who uh, have somehow managed to keep their taste intact through very successful careers, and they are eager for new music, new experiences. But the, And it's not the general populace. We have to bring the general popular, uh, populace, make them part of the argument. Mm. And you talk about making it an experience, and it's true that sometimes when I go to orchestral performances, not just in Australia, I'm confronted with the same repertoire everywhere I go. Well, it's interesting. Uh, the Chicago Symphony, for instance, has a, a complete commissioning program that runs through the year. Now, sure, they also have you know a sub subset um, uh, of different concert series with no new music, but they do have a series that uh, contains a high proportion of uh, commissioned music or new music. Um, it it is doable. You just need to do it long enough and um, encourage this sense of experiment and enjoyment. Do you think that the way or some orchestras are run because of it being a really hierarchical structure and also they have very limited rehearsal time in order to put some concerts together that it affects the desire to want to try something new or play something they haven't heard of before? Uh, absolutely. The, the economics are, are difficult for orchestras. As you say, they cost a lot. Um, and uh, frequently a commission, uh, commissioned work, you'll be lucky if you have six hours rehearsal before the world premiere. So you might have, you know, two hours one day, two hours another day, and then a one hour run through on the day of the concert. And that's it. So it, it, it just costs too much to bring all the musicians together and the conductor and any soloists. Um, and they think that, um, and it's pro possibly true, the audience for that concert will not be as high for a concert that is just Tchaikovsky and Beethoven. Um, and so th there are economic realities and you have to face those, but there, I believe there are ways to deal with that. And you do have a separate series for those who have no sense of adventure or indeed um, a sense of um, excitement in music and they're just doing it because they've done it for half their life. And there are other people. Mm. And the SSO used to run that separate series uh, a few years ago. They did the Carriage Work series, which was so cool, and then it just stopped. Well, the Carriage Work series always lost a lot of money. Ah, that explains it. That, that has been the part, because I've worked with um, Sydney Symphony for 30 years, on and off, and they used to have a, uh, there was always a modern music series, and it always lost a lot of money. Um, but they would, you know, run it for a while. It ran at the Bruggen Hall at Sydney Conservatorium, which is a much cheaper venue, smaller, and that was about the right size. It still lost money. Uh, and before then, it was at the Town Hall, Sydney Town Hall. Um, but th that's um, just the way of things. But the last conductor of, of Sydney Symphony, who I think had a, a really cohesive view of taking the audience on that journey was Stuart Challender, who died in 1993. Um, and he was uh, born in Sydney, studied in Germany, uh, but came back and really had a vision of a Sydney orchestra and the Sydney um, society, all of the suburbs, moving forward. And he had a, a long-term plan about encouraging um, Sydney composers, particularly, and making it part of the orchestra's um, uh, history and its future. And no one since then has had uh, anything like that view. For our second musical intermission is an excerpt from one of Carl's latest premieres, the 2019 premiere of his Piano Sonata No. 4 at Carnegie Hall, performed and commissioned by pianist Lindsay Garretson.
Now, I've got a bit of a weird question. This is more, I suppose, a composer's question. But say you're working with one of the orchestras in Australia, maybe one of the ones on the eastern coast. If you wrote something as technically difficult as the Rite of Spring, which is now an orchestral standard, would it be comfortable for the orchestra? Would it be playable, given the amount of time that they actually have with the new music? No. <laughs> That's a, a very simple answer. And that, that actually happened to me um, on my second symphony, which was a co-commission of the Melbourne and Sydney Symphony Orchestras. And um, this was back in, golly, what was that? Um, 1988. Um, and the, the conductor had only allowed one rehearsal. So it was basically two hours to rehearse a 20 minute piece that was incredibly difficult. And so about, about halfway through the rehearsal, he realized he wasn't going to get there. So he just threw his hands up and said, I oh, will just see what happens on the night. And we, we did, we saw what happened on the night and it was 20 minutes of complete mayhem. It didn't resemble the score at all. So that that was when I realised I could not write really hard music for Australian orchestras. Do you think it's just, at that time, just Australian orchestras you were experiencing this with? No, and uh, frequently now, if, if I'm asked to write a piece for an orchestra, I'm, I will say in the negotiation, how much rehearsal will there be? And sometimes, I don't think it's ever been in a contract, but normally they're pretty honest. They say, well, we can only give you two calls. And that's good. That's four hours. So I know how hard you can make an orchestral work to prepare in four hours. And occasionally they've said four hours and I've actually got six. And that was exciting. That means I'm, I'm almost as good as, um, oh, I don't know, try to think of a less, Scriabin, let's say. Um, <laughs> I, I got that much rehearsal time. Um, but basically the, compo the conductor uh, understood the score and thought it was worth working on, but it doesn't happen all the time. Does that, well, I suppose it does, but does that affect how you write in terms of limiting what you can write or what you were willing to explore orchestrally? Well, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, then you, as a composer, you have to make the choice. Am I going to write something without considering the performers at all and so that maybe sometime 200 years after I'm dead it'll be rediscovered and played properly or will I write something that is playable on two hours preparation and particularly with concertos I think I've managed to do this quite well with my last few concertos the orchestral part can be can be loud and can be effective but really easy to play and the soloist, unlike the orchestra who's played the piece for two hours before the world premiere, will have played it for three months. And so as long as the soloist, the soloist does all of the hard stuff, all of the virtuosic uh, show off and they flick their hair in the air and do all the, the soloist things, and the orchestra can just chug along making a lot of noise and a lot of interesting sounds, but it's easy to play and easy to rehearse. And so I, I have actually, I think, got quite good at doing that. And this will be different, of course, experiencing writing for chamber music. You have more time, I'm assuming, to rehearse and workshop. Absolutely. And, and a good chamber group, um, if they're playing a work that they have uh, chosen to do, they will work on it for, um, they will give it 500 hours of preparation, not two hours. And, and so the average string quartet, and if you go to hear a string quartet concert, they didn't just get together yesterday like the orchestra did. So each time you go to an orchestral concert, you should think, well, two days ago, they didn't know any of this music. Now they do. If you go and hear a string quartet, frequently they've been playing it for 10 years. Or if it's a new work, they might have commissioned it three years ago, they've played it 300 times. I could probably keep asking you questions, given this absolute wealth of experience that you have um, from orchestral programming, concert presenting, all the way to, of course, your composition career as well as teaching. But I do have to ask, what do you have going on now or coming up? A couple of years ago, I was on the jury of the Sydney International Piano Competition. It was one of the players who um, I was particularly impressed with, um, an American girl called Lindsay Garretson. 
Um, and she didn't make it, I think, to the third round, but she'd played my piece Toccatissimo in the second round. Um, and I thought it was a, a terrible crime that she didn't carry through in the competition. So I spoke to her when I was able to, because she was no longer in the competition. Um, and we stayed in touch and um, she said she'd like to commission me to write a piece. And as it turned out, I did. And um, it took, I suppose, about 18 months altogether to put it together and um, to thank her for having the idea of commissioning my fourth piano sonata. Um, she had the exclusive right to play it for 12 months. And the uh, middle of that 12 months um, started happening through COVID-19. And so uh, that's ex been extended for another year. So she did the, the world premiere in uh, New York at Carnegie Hall. And she played it a couple of times in London and Paris. And then she was going to continue around the world playing it. But that never happened. So hopefully she'll have enough time to do that in the following year. Have all your other performances that were supposed to be this year, have they been postponed to next year? Um, I didn't actually have many others this year. Um, there was the, a new work that I finished earlier in the year that didn't have a performance date. That's supposed to be on uh, next July, but probably won't because of COVID, because I don't think we'll be out of the woods by then. Well, I'm not sure we will be either given the questions of travelling or getting audiences safely into closed venues, but I hope that we'll continue to hear more of your music soon. I just really wanted to say a huge thank you for coming onto the podcast and for talking with me and for answering all of my questions. Some a bit odd and some new and also some a repetition of things we've spoken about before, but always with such interesting insight and answers. Thank you, Carl. My pleasure. I hope, I hope it comes out in the, in the edit. And stay well in Sydney. For everyone who's out there listening, information about Carl, his work, his recordings, including Lindsay Garretson's recordings of his full sonata, and all of his piano works, by the way, uh, information about Music of Viva and any of Carl's upcoming performances uh, will be linked below. Cheers for listening to another episode, and I'll catch you all next time. <laughs>